I was planning to begin by singing, but I think I've been upstaged. <laughs> it's a pleasure to stand up here for a second time, and I have to say there's a great difference between when I stood here yesterday and when I'm here today. And a lot of it has to do with realizing that we are a group gathered together of thinkers and doers. Some of us are more focused on the thinking side and some on the doing side. But after all that we heard yesterday listening to the panelists this morning, mostly colleagues in the museum field, it was really interesting to begin to knit together some of what we heard yesterday and some of what we started to speak about today. For those of you who weren't here yesterday and missed Matthew's introduction of myself, I'm simply going to say again that although I will be speaking about the Israel Museum and my experience there, I'm really a born modernist, a die-hard modernist. Before I went to Jerusalem 20 years ago, I thought that the cultural narrative started in 1850. I got there and realized otherwise. And the story that I want to talk about now is actually to use the Israel Museum as a kind of case study that will set the stage for the panel presentations that will follow on producing knowledge and truth. Our museum was only founded in 1967, 1965. Israel was in its teens, this is only 52 years ago. An amazing visionary who was named Teddy Kollek, who was kind of the Thomas Jefferson for a modern Jerusalem, envisioned what Jerusalem would be for the state of Israel. He saw Jerusalem as a unified cross-cultural city and the texture of Jerusalem today preserves that heritage. Teddy was born in Vienna and the Kunsthistorisches Museum for him was a kind of model and his strong feeling from the first day was that a city needed to have an encyclopedic museum in order to be a modern cultural capital in the world. His idea was very simple. It's astonishing to look back and to think about it. His vision was to create a museum on a hilltop at the entrance to Jerusalem, that its architecture should be a modernist backdrop, a neutral envelope where an encyclopedic narrative could be told. That architecture was created by a Russian-born, German-trained emigrate to Palestine who brought international modernism to Israel. That's the main architectural language of the campus. Frederick Kiesler, the Austrian architect who came from a completely different modernist background and who emigrated from Austria to the US, created the shrine of the book where the Dead Sea Scrolls would be housed. As I mentioned yesterday afternoon, Isamu Noguchi, the Japanese land artist really, you can call him today, who emigrated to the west coast of the U.S., laid as a wash across the Jerusalem landscape his references to an Asian landscape as a backdrop to show the development of the modern western sculptural tradition. So even without anything inside this campus, the seeds of universalism from a modern perspective were planted when Teddy had his vision and began to realize his vision for the museum. Teddy himself was intuitive at best. He wasn't an art historian, he wasn't a museum person, but he simply was a visionary and he traveled the world encouraging donors all over the world to give collections to the museum. Again, he had no art historical background, he had no idea of the narrative that he would create he simply wanted finest quality material and he succeeded in an amazingly short time in accumulating close to half a million objects which would become the museum's collections and that would actually connect across time and across geography around the world. And again, all of this was serendipity at best. I'm showing you this image of May 11th, 1965, the day the museum opened. And you know, we all come from a different culture, but if you think of a place that was brand new then, putting this piece of magnificent international modernism on the top of this rocky Jerusalem landscape, it's something pretty extraordinary. On the stage that day, Teddy Kollek is the guy in the middle 
to his left is the president of Israel, to his right the guy with frizzy hair is David Ben-Gurion, a figure whose image you may have seen before. And these guys are only here because, again, you have to realize this scrappy young country was busy doing so many things, and yet the president and the prime minister managed to show up on that day to help open the museum. Al Mansfeld, who created the museum, in an instant had the idea for what to do there. If you look at the drawing on the top, it's his first sketch of an Arab village on a Jerusalem hilltop, being our hilltop. His second sketch translates that into a modernist, modular vocabulary that would establish the museum and would allow it to grow over time as a village would grow. And down below you see the east elevation, that same elevation of the museum, two or three years later. And actually for all of us who built buildings and worked with architects, this may be the only time in the history of modern architecture that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence from the first sketch to the actual realized project. If you fast forward from this moment, you come to 1996, when I arrived at the museum, as I described yesterday, I started to ascend the promenade as those first visitors were in 1965. Being a modernist junkie, I was weak at the knees because I was seeing international modernism as architecture doing what it was supposed to do, which was to join site, setting, landscape, and architecture rooted to its setting to become the neutral backdrop for whatever would be inside. What I realized when I started to wander the museum was, of course, that this place with more than 500,000 objects covering time and covering geography was in fact the sort of fountainhead or the mother load, the place where in fact you could fashion a continuous narrative from a million and a half years ago to the present. And you could do it on a hilltop in Jerusalem, a city built of its own bedrock, also making it unique, and being a city, one of the cities of the world that sits at the center of the universe. So here in a flash, and I don't know how it is that I thought it then, but it proved out later on, here in a flash would be the opportunity to elevate the notion of encyclopedic to the notion of universal and to realize that that shift is all about context and making context for everything that's part of the story. I'll fast forward again to 2010. In the summer of 2010, we inaugurated a renewal of the museum. Out of what had become 550,000 objects, we distilled 7,000 objects that could be ordered and invented indeed to tell that continuous narrative from a million and a half years ago to the present that would indeed connect across time and around the globe and would present in fact for our purposes this afternoon a case study for producing knowledge that uses the material cultural vocabulary and for producing truth by beginning with a certain idea and letting that idea unfold through material culture over time. In the case of our museum, it might be that that narrative is about the first glimmerings of existential reflection and getting on the relentless highway that goes from that moment ultimately to the unfolding of the Western monotheistic faiths and becomes a kind of armature for a narrative that for us connects archaeology from prehistory to almost a modern time, allows it to relate contextually to the cultural history of the Jewish world, and allows that narrative to relate contextually to the narrative of the fine arts in the Western and non-Western traditions. This was, in short, a complete rethinking of that museum but based on the potential of what had been accumulated there, it was physically a complete re-engineering of the museum, but it was also about using original materials and finish, 
finishes and keeping the spirit of the original intent of the first image that I showed you. Here you see the museum as it is today. Not very much different in spirit from the bottom image that you're seeing here. Here you see the expanse of the museum's campus. I described yesterday afternoon the sort of breathlessness of the opportunity which we all don't have, but the opportunity of a site that expands, in this case, across 20 acres and in a setting and in a geography that adds to its meaning. In the re-engineering of the museum, we created a kind of central place. Of course, we call it the Cardo being the place from which you can begin an archaeological narrative that begins at the beginning, passes through time, connects to the Jewish world cultural narrative, connects to a fine art narrative. And I'm quickly going to just take you through that with a few examples, trying to connect the dots for what this statement is about. Each wing begins with, with you know, you can write anything you want on a wall, and in our case, we do it in three languages, Hebrew, Arabic, and English, but no one reads. They look. They're in a museum setting, and they look. And in our place, as you enter each wing, the statement is always a statement that becomes pervasive for your visit to that part of the museum's holdings. In this case, you enter archaeology by looking at these anthropoid sarcophagi from 1500 BC, which are the moment when those Canaanites and those Egyptians happened to follow the same ritual practices and have the same aesthetic vocabulary. In this case, with regard to how they practice burial. As you go through the wing, you follow the narrative that I described. Here's the moment when those Canaanites, almost at that same time, having listened to Akhenaten talk about worshiping one force, in this case the sun, not many forces, and this is just a nanosecond before the beginning of monotheism that would lead to the forming of, of First Temple theology. Here in the Byzantine time, you see in a pretty magnificent setting, a moment in the ancient land of Israel where formative Christianity on the left, formative Judaism on the right, and the seeds of Islamic practice just at the bottom of the image all are happening concurrently in the ancient land. And this narrative continues until Islam migrates to the east and we end with Islamic art from Isfahan from the 18th century. So it's a story that begins in the land, is about religion, and moves until it moves far to the east to this flowering of, of Islamic art, a collection that has been part of the museum since it was founded in 1965. You move from here to Jewish world culture. Our point here is to look at Jewish world culture worldwide. So it's about east and west. It's about secular and sacred. We begin with the cycle of life, birth, marriage, and death points that are essential to religious theology in any practice. As you go through the wing, you see this merging of east-west sacred secular. We also have synagogue interiors from three continents, from Europe, from Asia, from the Americas. Again, to give a sense of how practice adapts as it moves around the world and to relate to the point of migration, something that for us has always been a subject and which now, of course, for all of us is a subject in a different way. As you move to the fine arts, we cover all of the Western fine arts and non-Western. Of course, we begin with Israel because we are in Israel, but then we return to Europe, old masters, the traditional move through 18th and 19th century, early modern art, classic contemporary art, and from there we move to the non-Western cultures, drifting from east to west, from Asia to Oceania to Africa, sometimes giving peekaboos like this so that you can see the relationship between Max Ernst and Matisse and African art, and ending with the Americas. And at the end of that narrative, you come outside to the Isamu no Gucci Garden, and here we really do track the history from modern Western sculpture at the late 19th century to contemporary work, and here you just happen to see uh, from the minimalism of Saul LeWitt on the right to the maximalism of Doug and Mike Starn on the left. So 
for us, this is not just a landscape, it's not just a museum, but it's a laboratory for strategies relating to many of the subjects that we've all been discussing. Now to shift to talking about complex political times. Somehow in our setting, we feel that we're not about complex political times. In fact, we feel very strongly that we need to be the antithesis to that story. We are in Jerusalem, one of the centers of the universe. We are in Israel, which is surely at the center of today's geopolitical complexity. But we don't feel that we are there. And actually, I don't feel that I'm here to discuss geopolitical complexity. We feel that our focus needs to be about our standing as universal, in a way about being extraterritorial, if it is possible to say that. It's about our standing on the international cultural landscape together with all of us. And we feel in this respect that particularly for us, our mandate is to lift those ever-changing geopolitical demarcations that riddle the globe more and more and to tell the cultural narratives that emerge from the landscape beneath and to deliver messages that are perhaps relevant to an understanding of what is happening in the world today. We also feel, and we've already discussed this here, that we all together have an obligation to reflect on the, fra on the frailty of our standing collectively as museums in an unsettled time in the world. What does a museum mean today? And how can we be sure that we are giving meaning to ourselves as museums today? And this is exactly why we are here. You know, some of what the discussion has been about so far is, is the way that we relate or don't relate to government. And I have to say that for us, this is not an issue. We are de facto the National Museum, but we are actually a private museum. And perhaps it's unique that our constituent, constituency consists of organizations in 16 countries around the world that do support us. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with the question of what is happening in our countries. And several have referred either obliquely or directly to the nationalism that is growing everywhere and that threatens the independence that we've all been used to have, used, we've been used to having in the past. And I want to give quick answers to those questions just with one short story and a quick look at two exhibitions. The short story is about the visit of America's last president, President Obama, in the spring of 2013. He came for his first time as President of the United States. He was in Israel for only 46 hours. He decided that he would spend two of those 46 hours in the shrine of the book to understand the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those of you who know about the Dead Sea Scrolls may know that doing so was a kind of lightning rod move to understand the roots of the intercultural religious heritage that begins in our part of the world. The Dead Sea Scrolls are foundational for the Hebrew Bible. The Isaiah Scroll is considered by Orthodox Christians as the fifth gospel. The angel Gabriel appears many times there, is central to Judaism and Christianity and Islam in many ways. And for President Obama, it was a quick absorbing and a quick understanding of the meaning of that deep rootedness from this place. I'm going to show you a few images quickly, one after another. I want you to look at the body language of these images, because this was not about a political visit. It was about a visit to understand something that he felt would be meaningful. I want you to see the president and the prime minister moving sort of further and further apart, now being separated while they're looking at the Isaiah scroll, and a departure and an appreciation of thanks which was directed to the museum. So that this really was about using what we actually exist for, an opportunity to deliver knowledge exactly about this universal character. This would have been enough 
But what happened that night was that John Stewart, I don't know if you all know John Stewart, who used to be the great late night uh, talk show satirist in the US, John Stewart, who perhaps should be the next president of the United States, always opens his show with something very topical. And can you imagine that he picked this moment of our looking at the Isaiah scroll as the way to open his program? There could have been plenty of other meat for his satire from that visit, but instead he chose to be serious. And this allowed the message that I've just described to go out, of course, in the media and the social media become viral and give celebrity to this point about being the antithesis to the politics of the moment. Now, briefly, two exhibitions. The first, one from two years ago, an exhibition called Hadrian, an Emperor Cast in Bronze. This exhibition was very simple. It was the only three surviving bronze portrait busts from the time of Hadrian's rule. Hadrian, as we know, was the great empire builder in the golden age of Rome. He was also a crushing conqueror in some parts of that empire. These three portrait busts are all very simply about depicting the same man, but the distinct ethnicities of the different parts of the empire where each was sculpted show that somehow you can have difference and distinction even under the same imperial umbrella. The stretch of landmass here of that empire was Iraq to the UK. It's the landmass that is in trauma today with regard to the challenge of refugee migration, migration and chaotic movement. Three portraits from three museums. This is ours from the Israel Museum, classic Roman in its, in its aesthetic. This is from the British Museum, dredged up in the, in the River Thames. This is from the Louvre, from West Asia. So here are three objects, unique, they had never been shown together, from England, France, and Israel, the British Museum, the Louvre, the Israel Museum. The political views of these three countries are not the same. Its museums are very close. And at a moment when we're seeing the dramatic shifts that we're seeing and the destruction that we're seeing, to be able to bring these three precious objects together with such simplicity has a huge amount of meaning. Finally, Matthew spoke about are not forgetting to include a discussion of artists in our time in these conversations. Yuri already referred to Ai Weiwei. We also at the same time as Yuri have had the opportunity to work with him and I'm going to describe this because of the meaning that it's had not just for us but for all of the people who live in Israel. We all know that Weiwei is one of the most visible, one of the most visible and perhaps important artists in our time. His agenda could not be more timely because it's about the condition of humankind today. Last spring, he was in the West Bank filming for his film on refugee migration, Human Flow, which premiered last week in Venice. And somehow, he thought to come to visit the Israel Museum. He had an hour and a half. In an hour and a half, we covered a million and a half years. You know that he's a social media junkie and he was Instagramming everywhere. My pocket was buzzing with messages from people all over the world. And it was a thrilling experience. At the end, he hugged all of us and he said goodbye and we thought that was the end of the story. Two months later, he, we actually had a phone call saying he couldn't stop thinking about the message of the museum and he would be willing to do an exhibition at the earliest possible time that we could commit time and space to him. Of course, we did everything that we could to create that opportunity. The exhibition opened on June 1. The idea of the exhibition, and this took a few months to shape between us, was to be specifically meaningful about the resonant connections between people who live in China and all of the people who live in Israel. Thinking about 5,000 years of continuous living culture on the two bracketing, bracketing Asia, at the two edges of Asia. And the idea for the exhibition would be using only major metaphors from his work that would have meaning in China and meaning in Israel. We debuted for the first time these monumental cast iron trees 
You, of course, are familiar with his wooden trees, but to place these monumentally scaled cast iron trees in a color that you don't see in the landscape of Israel, in the front of the iconic shrine of the book which holds the Dead Sea Scrolls, is something pretty powerful. For, for people in Israel, the silhouette here relates to the notion of the olive tree, its immortality, its connection to the tree, to, to the wood of the true cross, which was taken from an olive tree. And these are magnificent. They're stunning in their setting. Weiwei saw them for the first time when he arrived a week before the opening of the exhibition. And he was moved. Other installations in the exhibition relate, of course, to iconic imagery, some of which you may know, and of course you know about seeds, but why are seeds important for us? All the people of China eat sunflower seeds and spit out the husks. All the people in Israel eat sunflower seeds and spit out the husks. Wooden trees, of course, are classic in their meaning in China and the meaning that I've already described for all of the people in Israel. Very importantly, and to be here in Germany to speak about this is a little bit moving. More than a decade ago, Weiwei was commissioned to do for the Haus der Kunst in Munich as a carpet, an exact replica of the stone floor of the gallery in the Haus der Kunst where approved art was shown during the time of Hitler. Since its presentation there, he's never found a space where he could place the rug simply because the dimensions weren't there. As you look at this image, it's sort of amazing because in fact the rug fits precisely in this gallery. The work is called Soft Ground and the idea of the work is to cover history, to layer history and the meaning and the sensibility and the character of a time and a place can change just by the way that history covers itself. Here you see what happens on any given day, and it's one case where you're not only allowed to touch a work of art, but as long as you take your shoes off, you can walk on it. Nothing has given way, way greater pleasure than to see how soft ground has become a place where kids play. And the label, of course, explains all of the history, but for young people, just to come and get a different narrative from it is something with great meaning. Weiwei spent a week with us in Jerusalem. Here we were walking in the market and a seed seller who follows him on Instagram, recognized him, came up and asked for a selfie. This is a kind of footnote to universalism. Kids realized that they could take selfies and for me this couldn't be a more touching scene. If you look closely, you see Orthodox Jewish children and their parents and you see Muslim Arab children and their parents doing a selfie. And this is all about us and our audiences and the notion of bringing every community together and having them use the museum. The experience for kids of soft ground, the experience of taking selfies, they come up afterward and they say, this is a beautiful place. Perhaps it's part of our mission for everyone from any community to come to a museum and leave saying, this is a beautiful place. So I close with an observation about today and this growing epidemic of feeling separated, of not feeling together, this notion of geopolitical isolation. And for us, the reverse. What we hope that we are having is the collective experience as players on the landscape of world museums and that as we sit here and talk and as we work together, as we go forward, we need to realize the ever greater power of joining objects under our custodianship to take messages about cultural connectedness from our landscapes out into the world and at this moment out into a fractious world. And if one needs to give a mandate for Universal Museums today, I would say that that is it. Thank you. Is it you? Yes, it's me. Moritz Voyan.
Hello, my name is Moritz Wohlen. Thank you for having me here. Um, in the next 15 minutes, I will have some thoughts on the question how universal can a universal museum be? Um, it depends, I think. It depends on its social intelligence and it depends on its social skills. And in the next 15 minutes, I will outline some aspects which seem really basic to me. And at the end, I will try to synthesize them to a more precise understanding what a universal museum in the 21st century might be from a sociological point of view. Um, the reason, one moment. Yes. Um, the reason, or the um, cause for my occupation with this topic is that I am involved in the making of a universal museum. I am talking about the Humboldt Forum. The Humboldt Forum is a very ambitious cultural project in the historical center of Berlin. This building under construction vis-à-vis -vis the museum island with its wonderful archaeological and art collections will be a joint event, exhibition and museum platform of the National Museums, the Humboldt University and the City Museum of Berlin. And a key element of this Humboldt Forum will be the ethnological collections of the National Museums, which have been showcased for decades in the outskirts of Berlin and which will now move to the historical center of Berlin as soon as the Humboldt Forum is opened. And the guiding idea is that the Humboldt Forum, together with the Museum Island, and together with all the other museum locations in Berlin, will constitute one unique universal museum. Of course, the institutions involved know that this universal museum will not contain a complete universe. It will not contain dinosaurs, it will not contain black holes, it will not contain aircraft carriers, it will even not contain the history of mankind. Take, for example, the Africa collection of the National Museum. The collection is called Africa Collection, but it doesn't cover Africa. It doesn't cover Africa from, or the history of Africa, from the dawn of mankind up till today, from the northern Mediterranean coast down to the southernmost tip of Africa. It only takes some very thin slices out of African space-time, focusing on some small time periods with about 500 years maximum, and focusing on some very small regions, mostly former colonies. But the institutions involved in the Humboldt Forum know that a universal museum is much more than a container which contains the universe. We do not define it as a closed space at all. For the institutions involved, it is much more an open space, a forum, a forum where objects and people meet to create new knowledge by connecting knowledge. And by creating knowledge, they get connected to more people and to more objects inside and outside the museum so that new knowledge comes into being again. And this process results into a network of knowledges, both social, individual, general and collective. Alexander and one moment, Alexander, Alexander and Wilhelm from Humboldt would have loved it. A universe of knowledges um, in which learning is a never-ending, lifelong experience. This was the key idea of their philosophy of education. While all this may sound abstract, it becomes easily understandable using an example, not from outer space, 
but from the collection of the Ethnological Museum. It is the Mandu Yenu, the throne rich of pearls. It was a gift of the King of Bamum in today's Cameroon to the German Emperor in 1908. And depending on who is meeting with this object, depending on who is talking with this object, this object tells different stories. Together with an, uh, with an ethnologist, this throne will tell you an exciting story about symbols of power in East African kingdoms um, in the 19th century. Together with uh, uh, specialists in the field of colonial history, this throne will tell you something about the complex interrelations between African rulers and European empires around 1900. Together with a maritime biologist, this object will tell you where the shells and pearls are coming from. And together with a researcher on the field of the history of global economy, this object will tell you why and how these shells and pearls were coming from the remote Indian Ocean to the East African coast. And last but not least, together with people from modern Cameroon, this throne maybe will tell you that it does not belong to Germany and that it wants to go home. So imagine, imagine all these people gathering around this object, connecting their stories, connecting their knowledges, and creating new knowledge. That's the way a universal museum works. Now, maybe you will ask yourself, it's all about connecting? That's a truism. We all know that everything is connected with everything. Why wasting a universal museum to a truism? But let's be honest, we all know somehow by media, friends, colleagues and so on, we all know somehow that we are part of a bigger picture and that we are connected to a world with global processes. But we do not know exactly how. You can prove it by asking yourself if you can give a concrete example of how your local individual life now here is connected with the world of global processes. It takes you a long time to find a satisfactory answer. The reason is that we all do know somehow that, but not exactly how. And knowing that without knowing how is not really knowing. It is much more believing. And that's the reason why a universal museum, which creates new knowledge by connecting knowledge, is far from being trivial. So, if you define a universal museum as a forum where objects and people meet to create new knowledge by connecting knowledge, you have to start right from the beginning with the engineering and the designing of social processes. You do not create a universal museum by inviting big universal minds to create it. So, imagine Stephen Hawking, the Dalai Lama, the Pope, and Peter Sloterdijk joining hands to form a circle and concentrating their mental energies on the idea of the Humboldt Forum, for example. Nothing would ever happen. It will never make pop. So you just have to create a situation in which objects and people can meet, connect, and create new knowledge. That's not only the way a universal museum works, it's also the way a universal museum begins. In the project Humboldt Forum, we kick-started this process by encouraging the curators from the different collections to meet, to exchange their ideas, to introduce themselves to the key objects of their collections, and to organize guided tours through their collections. It was amazing. Most of the curators in the museums, even within the national museums, have never seen each other before. So sometimes it was the first time of the curators from the ethnological and the non-European collections 
to get a guided tour by their archaeological colleagues on the museum island. The mental, the institutional and the social divides between the disciplines and between the institutions are so considerable. But nevertheless, it did not take long before the curators detected objects of mutual interest and came up with the idea to initiate an exhibition series bringing scientists and objects together. And we named this exhibition series New Neighbors. And we had wonderful meetings of objects and scientists on the museum island. We brought objects from the non-European collections on the museum island. We had a wonderful meeting, for example, of Vishnu with the ancient Greek gods in the pantheon of the old museum. Or we had, not this, but that, we had this wonderful juxtaposition of masterpieces of Japanese landscape painting of the 18th century which, with masterpieces by Caspar David Friedrich. Yesterday evening, we had a wonderful public talk in front of these masterpieces between our German curator for Japanese art with a Japanese specialist on German landscape painting, especially on Caspar David Friedrich. It was amazing, changing objects, changing roles, connecting knowledges, creating new knowledge. In addition, we created a contractual and organizational basis for the permanent exchange of the curators of the national museums with the natural scientists of the Humboldt University and the curators of the National History Museum. The point is, that all objects in our collection are both part of a cultural history and a natural history. And if you want to bring these histories together, you have to bring the scholars together. And for that, you need a contractual and an organizational basis between the institutions. We tested this, we made a, we made a test with uh, anthropologists, natural scientists, archaeologists, art historians, so, and so on, in our Humboldt box. The Humboldt box is our small testing ground for the future exhibitions in the Humboldt Forum. And uh, we brought them together. We gathered them around one object. It, is, it was a dried mummy from Peru, from the western coast of southern America, thousand years old. And then together, we created a mind-blowing story connecting all sorts of knowledges. We told a very complex and amazing story about the interrelations between death cult, religious beliefs, ecological situation, climate, climate change, sounds of nature, sounds of music, and so on. It was like a Universal Museum in a, in a nutshell. If you define a Universal Museum as a forum where objects and people meet to create new knowledge by connecting knowledge, you have to include all people, not only scientists. And there are a lot of people who know much more about the objects than scientists do. That's the reason, for example, why, um, our, why our ethnological curators are in permanent contact with individuals and communities worldwide who know much more about where the objects came from to Germany, how they came to Germany, and who know much more about the social, cultural, and ecological context of the objects. And if you, invite, if you want to invite all these people to come into your museum, in your universal museum, to share their knowledge with the people in your Universal Museum, with your audience, with your visitors, then, of course, you need an infrastructure which goes far beyond a classical museum. For this reason, the Humboldt Forum is a combination of museum, exhibition, and event platform. On the first place, on the first um, floor, 
the Humboldt Forum features areas for events with latest stage technology, more than 2,000 seats. In, on the second floor, we have the Humboldt Academy with working spaces for schools, groups, children. And even the permanent exhibitions on the second and on the third floor are interspersed with event areas which create a social space within the museum where people and objects can meet. And to breathe life into all these social spaces, we cooperate with a non-profit public limited company, the Humboldt Forum Kultur GmbH. Of course, a universal museum of this dimension has its physical limits. Um, it would be insane to transform the whole historical center of Berlin vis-a-vis -vis the museum island into an intergalactic spaceport where species and objects from all over the universe come together to connect their knowledge to create new knowledge. This would be really funny, but it would be insane. And so being realistic, we develop strategies to expand the Universal Museum into the virtual space. Together with the National Museums, the Humboldt Forum participates in an initiative called Museum 4.0, an initiative in which German museums conceive strategies how to bind objects, science, knowledge, and citizens together. In our vision, each object becomes the gravitation point of all kinds of knowledges, both in the physical and the non-physical space. It's a very ambitious project, structuring the non-physical world of knowledge by physical objects. To sum up, in the Humboldt Forum, we learned that a universal museum in the 21st century might not be a container which contains a universe. For us, it is much more an open space, a forum, where knowledge is constantly combinated, recombinated, and variated by social processes. So a universal museum defines itself not so much what it is, but by what it wants to become. And that is, I think, a social operator in the social evolution of knowledge. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Now, Carl Siegberg, Reberg. Thank you, my own Ackermann and Florence Thomas, for the invitation. And I want to make some annotations to the position of museums, especially these. Um, um, universal or um, other museums of knowledge in relation to public conflicts and their possibility of interventions. Without any doubt, it's praiseworthy to ask about the role of encyclopedic museums in political complex, or perhaps it would be better to say politically disturbing times, and for sure it's important for cultural institutions to turn against the hatred of strangers, the new nationalism and so on. Therefore, the coordinated defense of the leading cultural institutions of Dresden against the claims of the Pegida movement during its peak was quite impressive. Even though the idea to turn the fact that the Staatliche Kunstsammlungen are a home and guardian for many foreigners 
into rhetorical ammunition against uh, right-wing phrases and claims was really witty. The question, if this does not provoke some disquieting insights at the same time, remained undiscussed. In the meantime, the short form seems to experience a reflexive expansion as the program text for this international colloquium is demonstrating, clearly addressing an urgently needed self-related clarification of museums' facilities. Museums as institutions are not merely organizations, but also embody certain always controversial guiding ideas and orders of knowledge. When it's about different presences on public markets, as it was required by Olaf Wuhr Eliasson yesterday, one might think that it's easier for theaters to encounter the zeitgeist with direct artistic interventions because they still have some touch of the playfully unintegrated spirit of a constantly traveling a predecessors, although this is no longer visible through the institutional consolidation. One must not only think, and the actors of the theater who stood outside of the estate-based society order, but also of the catharsis of the attic theater of Schiller's idea about the playhouse as a moral institution and so on. In contrast to this, object collections of all kinds, including the encyclopedic, always served purposes of representation also, and to this day they can only position themselves in current disputes through their entrusted objects less directly. It was therefore required to develop new reflexive offers, which also have to influence the daily work of museums. In case of the Staatliche Kunstsammlung, and this is very urgently to consider since the recent integration, especially of the ethnographical collection of the Grassi Museum in Leipzig and other um, collections uh, some years ago. New and difficult tasks are coming alongside with this integration, so the Kunstsammlungen has to deal with it in a conscious way, especially before the background of a worldwide, often emotionalized conflict. I, for example, do not mean demands such as the recent ones, according to which the showing of objects that came of to, to the world's rich countries through a long history of oppression should be completely forbidden. This would only cause a different type of concealment of the historical developed collections, although a return of objects which are interpreted by the indigenous cultures not as objects, but as perhaps ghostly subjects seems at least to be worth it in consideration. One example of a possible conceptual idea to handle this in a reflective way uh, might be the ones of Hartwig Fischer that unfortunately have not been realized, perhaps because of a lack of possibilities in Dresden. Collections of objects sometimes being put together on an ethnologically based scheme, or sometimes pretty randomly, could provide occasions for contact with scholars, artists, and other people from their countries of origin. May Fisher succeed with those ideas in his new environment, the British Museum. Encyclopedic museums, since the Museum Kirchenianum, founded in the Collegio Romano, in 1651 are places of the presence of different world things and later foremost far-reaching, exotic appearing or at least astonishment-causing objects. This is especially true 
for ethnological collections which at the same time cause awareness about the fact that the encyclopedic collections are based on relations of dominance, especially those of the colonial era. In France in 1931, the treasures of foreign culture, cultures were first presented in an exposition coloniale internationale that attracted a remarkable number of 33 million visitors. Two years later, it became the institutionalized Musée de la France d'Outre-mer from 1960 onwards called Musée des Arts Africains et Océaniens. In London, it was also the success of the anglo indian colonial exhibition in 1886, which led to the founding of the Imperial Institute one year later. It was important for the French exhibition to suggest that the colonial empire should be viewed as a humanist, a humanist mission, so as to confront a German criticism which had denounced France as exploiters of colonies and perpetrators of racial shame and decadence. Nevertheless, a museum of the same kind was built in Berlin uh, Moabit during Germany's own short, but also many victims demanding colonial phase. Here, however, not in form of a public institution, but organized by a private holding company. Another hang-up were the so-called Völkerschauen, as, for example, exhibited by Karl Hagenbeck in Animal Parks. It's an interesting paradox that in comparison with a lot of traditional ethnological collections with their style of presentation that reminds on of their endless strung of usually find in depots, the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris brilliantly exhibits singular objects additionally often explaining their original use, besides the wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation of individual objects, this impressive house, any, 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 for uh, vernichtet, any relates, all colonial origins, which are not even indicated through the slightest historical explanation. Collections served the sovereigns, in the case of the British Museum, the Parliament, later also individual or association-bounded self-evaluation. They became a decisive medium of the first princely, later intellectual world disposition. The art museums became the leading institutions in collecting and showing combined with a long history of them opening up for a common public, which was first circumscribed, later generalized, and then, as a second factor, scientification. Images and education were inextricably linked and rules of collective exclusivity and habitually required contemplation emerged and established themselves. Museums have become places of knowledge and collecting had to become universal, at least in certain areas. In modern times, the splendor and the validity of museums combined traditional values with market dynamics. This was especially evident in the museum boom that has turned these honorable houses into event motors. So, what can cultural institutions, especially the, the uh, encyclopedic collections, accomplish in these certain matters? For example, political cultural discourse about today's developments in the countries from which important object groups originate could become a normal part of lectures and presentations in these institutions, uh, every day a task for these museums. All I want to say is, that the contribution to a critical enlightenment should not 
exhausts itself in gestures of protest. However, this is surely the necessary part of that. We have to raise an awareness of the circumstances that those institutions shape the feelings of identity in a city or region because of their charisma and take into consideration that they therefore are appreciated even by those who have never entered them. Nevertheless, they can be conceived as mere symbols of the established power in certain conflict situations, as one could observe well by following the development around the Pegida discourse and opposition. After their public alignment for a culture of welcome in the eyes of the right-wing um, uh, people, the cultural institution transformed remarkably frictionless from a symbolic homeland in Dresden, for example, into hostile areas. I'm not saying this to discourage such a truly welcome par partisanship, but it's important to understand this for being able to prevent the illusion that the prestige of the institution at itself has to convincing force in agitated political discourses and disputes. The discourse that we have had here in the splendid building of the former Sächsische Kunstverein since yesterday are in every detail, and this is also to um, remark and to reflect, in every detail, I would say, a contrast to the right-wing politicians and those who feel like they are represented by them, and not only um, by ideas, but also by the social position. It was an encouraging word said by James Snyder yesterday about us having to face difficult times with idealism and a little touch of naivete. But we should not be that naive, not consider our own social position. After the Trump election, liberal intellectuals outbid each other worldwide in self-condemnation as it has been displayed in many gazettes. They admitted to themselves that they might have lost their way by losing their eyes and ears for the people. Um, for example, another aspect of this um, self-critique was Liam Sillick's um, blame for cultural, for artists and other cultural activists um, that they have failed to raise their voice against the Brexit. I wouldn't recommend to put this discomfort in the center of public communication in and through the museums, even if there surely some necessity of self-criticism in any way. But one thing is clear, all the beautiful ideas and familiar values like those we are discussing were often not easily gained but fiercely fought for and are managed and guarded by elites. And the hatred of those who feel lost is aiming directly at them. This does not mean to completely disregard the public effective effectiveness of cultural institutions, but to always remember that one must not be deceived by one's own sometimes misinterpreted position. Most of those elites belong the small, is the small mobile class, as the sociologist Lord Darendorf called it, um, even if they are, um, uh, while, uh, as called it, while most of the population is relatively immobile, even if there is some certain kind of holiday mobility. To take the museum's own histories and objects, their presentation and self-examination in a critical way might be a key to strengthen their role in socio-political discourses. Finally, I want to give a very recent example from a time which is neither temporarily nor culturally 
far distant and that surely lies below the level of an encyclopedic representation of the world. I'm talking about the banishment of largest parts of artworks originating from GDR times in the collections that start in Kunstsammlungen and not only here, which is rightfully filling a lot of people with bitterness today. This was never attempted to be truly worked out, but rather displaced than discussed, just as if the former brothers and sisters from the East were way more distant and more disconnected as the Australian aborigines. This is all the more problematic of us should be aware the difficulty of making museums places of public discourses, as it was demanded in 1968, for example, when the temples of art, as it is inscribed in the tribuna of the Dresden's old master gallery, should become learning locations. But especially in GDR, with its attempt to shut down every possibility for public criticism, Art became, paradoxically, in the official state exhibitions, a function of discussion of social and political misdevelopments in front of the pictures. Finally, the officials, the officials even called for problem paintings, in so far the neglecting of the artistic traces of the state socialism also shows a pattern of dominance now between the so-called Vessis and the so-called Ossis, or over the so-called Ossis. Um, we heard with wonderful voices the atom of the GDR. And interesting is, it was since the 60s forbidden to sung the atoms because of the line of verse, Germany, United Fatherland, who really intends to go to the marketplace, especially in Dresden, Leipzig, Berlin, Weimar, etc., should consider that, although it was not an example of old cultures. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, Sira Zerzu. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Florence and Uta and Monica and all their colleagues for all these wonderful arrangements that we are benefiting from. Um, the terrain of debates about the future of the museum and of museum objects is not merely about a nationalist contest over the most appropriate national location for them to be held or cared for. It is also not merely about new museum partnerships over shared collections and stewardship training for the care of artifacts on loan to museums in source societies from which they originate. The work of changing museums involves transforming the concept of the modern museum that has been bequeathed to us as site of preservation and stewardship to one that appreciates the interrogative museum as site of knowledge contestation and transaction. Indeed, the new museum is constituted in the very processes of interrogation and contestation over meanings, legacies, and collecting histories, with artifacts animated through these knowledge transactions and contestations. <clears throat> 
The post-colonial museum is not merely an imaginary of new national museums with restored national collections that have been achieved through national processes of repatriation, as important as these issues are. Instead, the post-colonial museum transcends mere demands for decolonization, which is rooted in the idea of the nation, and insists upon the epistemic work of interrogating the categories, the classificatory systems that inaugurated the modern museum as marked by a division between the historical and the ethnographic, between the civilized and the people without history. Here, I want to argue that the frames of the stewardship of collections for future generations may be insufficient to maintain and defend the old museum in the face of powerful new arguments and approaches to museum as process and the interrogative museum. These new arguments do not merely seek the geographic reorganization of collections along national lines, but demand that old museums seek a new authority for these collections in their relationship with source societies. And it is precisely in these consultations, negotiations and contests that the meaning of the new museum is to be found and that the dilemmas of the unsettled objects in those museums will be addressed. The museum is not only an institution of modernity and ordered citizenship, but it is the primary institutional form of empire and coloniality. It was made and is being remade and adapted through both sides of colonialism's history by a rapacious and violent empire of plunder and pacification, as well as by empire as benevolent colonization, humanitarianism and trusteeship over people and things. This was a simultaneous expression of collecting, documenting, and administering, safeguarding and preserving things and people through appropriation and stewardship. The administrative and classificatory systems of the museum through which the world was made knowable drew very emphatic distinctions between people of culture and those of nature. The Natural History Museum became the site of collecting and displaying the material culture of subject people, as well as the site for collecting and documenting the physical anthropology of race. Even the supposed cosmopolitanism of the encyclopedic museum was marked by this classificatory and hierarchical character, as we heard earlier today. Humanitarianism was not simply a masked packaging of empire and colonialism. Rather, compassion and sympathy was a means of solidifying social hierarchies. Moreover, empire's humanitarianism had another dimension to it, namely a gesture of rescue and recuperation, especially of species and life forms deemed to be in danger of extinction or disappearance. The major challenge posed by colonialism is to move from an understanding of colonialism as time and colonialism as place, as formal system of rule, to an understanding of coloniality as epistemology, as a politics of knowledge. Another challenge is to move from an approach, for example, to German colonialism as a subject or a topic of German history, albeit examined in detail recently in Berlin, to one which recognizes the extent to which coloniality marks 
Germany in quite profound ways. So while Germany might have had a brief experience of colonialism, this made one of the, which made one of the leaders of the Humboldt Forum to suggest that as a result, Germany is relatively untouched by colonialism. Germany remains profoundly marked by coloniality all over, with its museums, university disciplines in the humanities, demanding a much more far-reaching engagement with anti-colonial struggles and a post-colonial politics that is epistemic. New museums seek not only to present objects differently, but to inquire into their value, meaning, and social life in a post-colonial world. This museum inheritance posed challenges for healing a society. This museum inheritance in South Africa, which was shot through with this kind of classificatory system, characterized by a division between the people deemed to have culture and history and those deemed to have tribe as well as the physical features of race. This is the inheritance that has posed challenges for healing a society from the ravages of colonialism and apartheid and for building a democratic non-racial society. How could these old divided national museum collections marked by colonial classificatory divisions become museums of the new non-racial nation. What did non-racialism mean for the classification system? What did it mean for the museum infrastructure? And what did it mean for the administration of collections and artifacts that had been segregated? And so a new flagship national museum was created in Cape Town out of an amalgamation of the old previously segregated National Museum collections, Iziko Museums of South Africa. And part of the amalgamation and the integration of the collections meant that a new collections division was created, which was simply called social history. A new storage facility was also created for these conjoined collections. This new collections building was not merely a new store, but rather became the site, I think, for an internationally significant epistemological project of taking previously segregated cultural history and ethnography collections to do the collections management work of placing them within a single collections division. This epistemic work also has to pay attention to labeling and object biography in ways that remove administrative racism while showing the history of race and ethnicity in labeling. And out of this process, it has emerged that the ethnologisch, as it is called in German, has no place in the museum landscape of South Africa's future. In the same way as when we hear discussions in Germany make use of the idea of non-Europe, the non-European, it does violence to the way we think about our humanity. So just as one problematizes race and ethnicity in the history of the administration of persons, so one has to think historically about the categories of the administration of museum objects and collections. As much as we can identify how artificial and constructed ethnicity is, we need to be able to understand how ethnicity and ethnic categories themselves have history. Colonialism has also often had the effect of removing people from any sense of indigenous continuity with pre-colonial societies. And it's been, it is important to understand how new expressions of a politics of indigeneity have been emerging in which people have sought to narrate their lives in new indigenous terms. And where this indigeneity is the basis of a new and aspiring modernity, sometimes even expressed as the recovery of indigenous knowledge systems. And for this, an older language of ethnography has sometimes been employed 
that draws upon the research and publications of the old colonial anthropologists for assistance. As part of the transformation of the old museum collections in, at Iziko Museums of South Africa, the collections of the dead whose bodies had been stolen from their graves or had been acquired for the purposes of racial science were removed from the collection under the new terms of a human remains policy and set aside in special no access stores until such time as a national policy comes into operation. And after that famous South African Museum display, the Bushman diorama was closed down, a decision was also made that racialized body casts should also be considered as unethically collected human remains. The experience of creating social healing through the return and reburial of the remains of people whose bodies had been stolen, such as the remains of Klaas and Troy Pinar, were brought home from Vienna in 2012, was widely expected to influence a process of returning the dead from museums in South Africa. These returns would not merely be a rollout of events of deracialization, but would constitute the new content of the museum itself, with processes of return constituting processes of remaking museums. And as the legacies of race and physical anthropology as science are attended to as part of the decolonization of museums in South Africa, Iziko Museums, as I've said, have shown that it is possible to rethink the value of the category of ethnography. Now, that museums nowadays are much more about people and creating civic forums for discussion and debate is powerfully shown in the cultural and memory work of community history museums in South Africa that emerged from the mid-1990s. The foremost example of this kind of new museum of process as a, has been the District 6 Museum in Cape Town, which came into existence as a site museum, and not just a history museum, but a politics of history museum. The District 6 Museum has worked with the idea of museum not as collection, but as site inscription, memory work, and as transactions of knowledge, and that is whose main methods of interpretation have involved site visits and commemorative walks, using the resources of memory, trying to ensure that a land restitution process pays attention to questions of memory. Now, the post-ethnographic museum and the museum of process both point to the possibility that the modern museum as the world has known it, which emerged as part of the making of the modern person, and that coincided with the colonization of the world, may have outlived its value. Yet the post-museum can only be the outcome of a sustained engagement with the basic museum work of collecting, conservation, exhibition, and education in ways that enter into battle with the colonial concepts of race and ethnic group that seem almost naturalized and frozen into who we are. In general, it is critical to think about the connections between the administration of people and the administration of artifacts into the, in the museum and to rethink society and to rethink the museum at the same time. What we are talking about in this questioning of race, ethnicity and ethnography is a new critical citizenship and what it means to be a human, what it means to be human in a post-colonial world. In considering how the museum is changing, we need to understand how old collecting museums have been challenging themselves and how new interrogative museums of process have begun to expand museum horizons to embrace, to embrace the downtrodden, the oppressed and exploited of the world, whose experiences might previously have been confined and contained through colonial ethnography and even a denial of coevalness.
This focus on local and deep histories of oppression, displacement and survival, while guarding against the triumphalism of nationalism, needs to consider the ways it offers new understandings of what museums are, as well as the possibilities for new museologies for the 21st century. To question the museum is not merely about expunging its rapacious histories and shoring up the vestiges of a remaining benevolence framed as preservation and stewardship, but requires questions posed about the syndrome of preservation itself. Transforming the museum requires understanding its history as the locus of empire and coloniality in all of its forms and to embark on the difficult work of interrogating its collecting histories, its epistemologies, and to think about museums outside evolutionary frames and the impulses of preservation and atonement, the post-colonial museum may indeed require the inauguration of the post-museum itself. Thank you. None of our speakers are off the hook. They're going to come back after the break and after our next group of speakers. So let's take a 15-minute break, come back, four more talks, and then we'll all gather here. So 15 minutes. <laughs>